When you are swimming in an excess of primary energy, it is easy to think that the energy commodities are yesterday's industries, can be thought of and treated like just any other fungible commodity, and don't really matter all that much. It's only when you enter into a, an unexpected period of primary energy shortage do the laws of physics take over and dictate the policy choices for our leaders. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? Welcome back to Winner is Coming on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at Abex Technologies. Our guest today is Doomberg, the team behind one of the most widely read finance newsletters on Substack. We'll be discussing the energy crisis in Europe and what Western policymakers need to understand about the energy markets. Hello, Doomberg. Welcome to Smarter Markets. David, really fantastic to be here and uh, a true honor. I, some of the amazing guests you've had on recently. Um, and I was uh, really flattered when you sent us the invite and, and looking forward to a fantastic discussion today. Oh, me too. Me too. I was really flattered when you accepted our invitation. And I, I've really been looking forward to discussing your perspective on the energy crisis that's now engulfing Europe and that, you know, we've been talking about with a lot of different perspectives from our, our different guests recently. And, you know, to get your idea for what, if anything, we can do about it at this point. But before we dive into that, I'm sure our listeners will have noted that you and your colleagues have chosen to keep your identities private. So I was hoping, you know, to give them a better understanding of your perspective, could you just give us a quick introduction for our listeners, maybe share a little about your background, and tell us why keeping your identities private is important to you? I'm more than happy to, David. So as, as you mentioned, yes, we are uh, anonymous. I'm the head writer for a, a small team that uh, runs the Doomberg Substack. In our real lives, we are consultants, uh, former industry executives in the commodity sector. I'm personally a scientist by training and spent a couple of decades you know, leading worldwide teams of, of researchers working on tough problems in the energy sector. And so my editor-in-chief, for example, has a very strong finance background. And so together uh, as a team, we, um, we were consultants and doing quite well. Um, after having left industry, we have probably 50 years of industry experience combined on the team. And, and, um, and then COVID hit and it put a big dent into our business. Like many um, small business owners, we, we lost something like 80% of our business virtually overnight. And, and you have to decide what you're going to do. And um, we got a, a really fantastic piece of advice from a, a famous hedge fund manager who suggested that we look into helping people who create content and sell it into Wall Street, um, look into helping such people run their businesses better. He recognized our sort of understanding of, of the finance world from the industry perspective, but also our abilities as, as business leaders and strategists. And, and we embarked upon that journey. And, and it really was a, a fantastic 12 to 18 months after we decided to open up that vertical in our consulting business. And it, and it was much more fun than our prior <laughs> work, which had focused on C-suites and family office types. And we had a lot of success. And one of our best clients suggested that we just start our own. His advice was, you will follow all of your own advice, unlike me, and build something from scratch. I'll lend you a hand. And it was uh, the beginning of truly the work of, of our lives. It's been an unbelievable 18 months, and we've, we've grown the brand. Um, we've, we've improved the product. We've since made it our full-time job. We've put our consulting business on hold. We've kept only our favorite clients. We're turning away business. Uh, and we do Doomberg for a living. And so why stay anonymous? I can tell you why we started anonymous. It's very difficult to build a brand behind a person from scratch if you have no social media presence. And uh, one of our rules in marketing when we would help clients is you, you can't be remembered if you don't stand out. Hmm. And uh, the green chicken, just we sort of designed it one day. We we're playing around with names. We did some preliminary A-B testing. It scored amazingly well. And we just went with it. Now, why stay anonymous? We have observed that when popular Twitter accounts or big anonymous social media accounts reveal themselves, sort of the air is let out of the balloon, the, the mystique, the intrigue is gone. And so Doomberg has grown so big and so fast that uh, we just can't ever re reveal ourselves. It's not some big secret. There's lots of people on the street who know who we are. Um, Substack knows who we are. Stripe knows who we are. You know, our bankers know who, who we are and that we're doing <laughs> Doomberg. It's, it's just part of the brand now. 
And then last point I would make is that I'm the person, sort of the head writer and the person who appears on podcasts, but we truly are a team, a very tight knit team. And um, it wouldn't make sense to rebrand around a person at this point. So we're just going to stay as the, as the green chicken. It's a fun character. And, and that's the background. Oh, that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it's so, so great to hear of people building something that's working so well out of, you know, the struggles that many of us had over the past few years and to do it as a team. I think that's, that makes it really worthwhile to be able to do it with people and let the green chicken stand out front and not the egos get in the way. So congratulations on that. And thank you. One of the things that I think brought a lot of people to your writing uh, in part was that, you know, in addition to having that science background and that strong background in the finance and the commodity markets, you've also been a strong critic of Western policymakers regarding some of their decisions in Europe for, you know, well over a year, you know, longer than it's been in the popular imagination. And I was curious from your perspective and maybe from your perspective as, as a scientist and an energy market expert, what do you think Western policymakers have been getting wrong about the energy markets? And why do you think that is? It's a very good question. And I would say um, the way we analyze the world is we begin with a very, very basic but critically important question. And it is the following one. Is the world currently experiencing an abundance of primary energy or a shortage of it. And unless and until you make an intelligent assessment of the answer to that question, it's very difficult to analyze the markets. For the better part of the past two decades, the Western world and a group of leaders within it have been bathing in an excess of primary energy, uh, driven predominantly by the boom in shale, oil, and gas production in the US. And when you are swimming in an excess of primary energy, it is easy to think that the energy commodities are yesterday's industries, can be thought of and treated like just any other fungible commodity and don't really matter all that much. It's only when you enter into a, an unexpected period of primary energy shortage do the laws of physics take over and dictate the policy choices for our leaders. And a confluence of many events occurred in the past couple of years that pivoted the world from an era of excess to an era of chronic shortage. And, and the three main ones are, one, the ESG movement and the desire to defund fossil fuels when we do not have bridging technologies other than nuclear, which is also opposed by the environmentalists. Uh, we do not have bridging technologies to get us from where we were to where we want to be with regard to carbon emissions. And yet we still sort of saw it away at the legs of our own stool um, by chopping away at the acceptability of funding fossil fuel development projects. That's one. But to be fair uh, to the environmentalists, it's also true that the shale booming incinerated a lot of capital, a lot of investor capital. And this was all driven by access to cheap debt and, and abundant uh, money. And that investor capital was burned. And then the precipitating event of the shutdown of the economy in response to the pandemic was really the catalyst that marks the pivot point from the era of abundance to the era of shortage. And so when those three things converged in March of 2020, you saw a wave of bankruptcies, particularly in the shell patch. And the companies that emerged uh, from court-supervised reorganizations have a cash-oriented mindset. They aren't investing. And now we have what we have, which is chronic shortages of primary energy and one of the themes that we've been pushing and a phrase we've become known for is energy is life. And uh, energy commodities in times of shortages are extraordinarily inelastic. And as we've said often, um, what is the price elasticity of demand for life and who can <laughs> pay it? And the clearing price for life is far above what most of the world can afford. And that's what we're experiencing right now. The genesis of the crisis uh, was born in Europe. It has spread globally. The economy cannot survive in the way that we're accustomed to if Europe collapses. And so we are really at a, at a really significant turning point, we believe, a historical one that is unfolding uh, in real time before us. And the one thing that you and Emmanuel Macron might agree on is that it's the end of the era of abundance. Well, I that's to... by choice, too, though, <laughs> in some ways, right? I mean, right. It's, it's a, it's, it doesn't need to be this way, which is why we've been so critical. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, it's, it's a very important point. You know, it's, I think with many of our guests, the conversation's always been, it's about investment. 
You know, it's about planning ahead and putting the dollars into the right places so that we don't run into these shortages and all the negative effects that come with them. And last week we had Dan Jurgen on to discuss his views on what's happening in Europe. And he he basically says we're in an energy war, that it's the second front in the battle for Ukraine. And in this war, I understand that you believe that Putin has the leverage. And is that right? And why? I imagine it goes back to this notion of elasticity. So Putin certainly has the leverage as it pertains to the economic part of this hybrid war. We believe and have written, and we're writing as, as far back as a year ago, that by handing our energy cards to Putin, we should not be surprised when he decides to play them. We just put out a piece about it, and we had a fake quote um, that we put in. We normally open our pieces with a, with a good quote, and, and this piece was called Europe on Tilt. And the fake quote that we used was, uh, in times of war, hand all the leverage to your enemy, then complain loudly when they use it. And we said, Sun Tzu, brackets, probably. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we handed Putin the keys to Europe's energy future. We believe that he understood the leverage that he had and is now using against Europe. When he decided, I think, in terribly incorrectly to cross the border into Ukraine and to initiate a kinetic war in the heart of Eastern Europe. I think that was a total blunder, to be very clear. We've been accused by some on Twitter of being sort of relatively pro-Putin in our analysis. Um, we don't think it is unpatriotic to point out the reality on the playing field and to suggest alternatives that we believe would actually help achieve our geopolitical objectives, which is what we've always tried to do. The cards that Putin has were given to him by the West. He's playing them now. Uh, some would say, and I, I put, would concur, that completely shutting off the gas from Nord Stream 1 is potentially a sign of weakness and desperation on his part. But it is certainly going to hurt Europe in the near term. What it does for Putin in the mid to long term is, is a different question whatsoever. But I do believe he has the leverage. He is using it. And uh, we're on the cusp of a very, very serious situation in Europe. In fact, we're in the middle of one, um, given the headlines of the past week, which have been literally unbelievable. Oh, it's, it's staggering when you look at the prices that are finally passing through. I know people who have been more involved in the commodity markets, you see it happening in you know, what one might call the wholesale markets you know, or the futures markets. You see those prices moving, but now it's flowing through to people's you know, home heating bills and energy bills, and you're seeing the, the devastating impact it's having on small businesses throughout Europe. And I think you've often made the important point that by trying to cut off the flows of Russian gas, by trying to push back against uh, Russia in that way, we've actually enriched them because of in the nature of commodity markets, you know, even though the volumes have fallen, the prices have gone up much faster. And so those revenues you know, have gone up for Putin instead of down. And as you said, that doesn't mean you're a cheerleader for Putin. You're just trying to point out something about how the way the world works so we can engage in a more productive way. And, you know, this result that we're seeing now, which is so devastating to many people, I think was largely foreseeable, right? I mean, you were talking about it. So I'm curious, you know, do you think it was foreseeable? And even now, how are you tracking the volume of oil and gas sales that Russia's lost because they're still making sales regardless of this. And so they're able to keep those revenues up. And where are those remaining volumes going, do you think? So this is where drawing on our direct and real world experience in commodities differentiates our analysis on this important topic, uh, we believe. Anybody who has ever operated, you know, actually ran a business in the commodity sector. I don't mean like worked at a think tank and studied charts or taught at a university and, and read theory. But if you've actually run a business with a P&L, you understand something very, very quickly. First thing is you make all your money in very short periods of time. And discount cash flow models make, they're almost meaningless for large commodity investments because you know that you make all your money in very narrow windows, and then you do your best to tread water in between. And, and why is that? You make all your money when there's a shortage. And this is because so just the analogy we've used, and it was totally predictable, we wrote a piece on June 1st called Crazy Pills, where we outlined what was wrong with the sanctions and what should be done to correct them. And here's, here's all you need to know. Putin exports 10 million barrels a day of oil. If we were successful in shutting in 5 million of those barrels, cut it in half, the price of oil would weigh more than double. And Putin would make more revenue on the 5 million barrels that were still finding their way to the market. And pr as perverse as it sounds, 
we should be encouraging Putin to flood the market. And we should be flooding the market because you cannot win a commodity war by trying to stop somebody else's volume from reaching the market. You can only win a commodity war where your objective is to reduce the value of your opponent's commodity by flooding the market with the commodity. Oil went to minus $37 a barrel on relatively minor excess and a lack of storage uh, at the peak of the COVID crisis. It swung violently to $125 a barrel on shortages as small as a half a million barrels a day. If we were smart about this and we had people in government who actually took the time to, well, preferably get some experience in industry, but at a minimum, treat them as your allies and and get them into a room and have an open and honest discussion about what should be happening, we would have understood this. this. The sanctions have hurt the West way more than they've hurt Russia. And the pain is still to come. And this is totally knowable utterly well-known. There are very few people with deep industry experience who have the freedom to write a blog like Doomberg. We have no overlords. You know, We can write what we want to write. Our, our subscribers pay our bills. We have no ads and take no sponsorships so we can have 100% editorial freedom. This is so widely known in industry that it is remarkable um, that this was the policy choice that we have made. Now, having made that mistake, how do you correct it? You literally decide tomorrow to A, admit this was a mistake, and B, hold a press conference surrounded by uh, industry executives from oil and gas and say, we were wrong. We're going to do everything in our power to pump as much energy into the market, to pivot the world back to a point of energy surplus, which will crush price and will defund Russia's uh, military expenditures. Uh, This is the only path forward. All other paths that are being chosen right now do nothing but increase the price of primary energy, which feeds Putin's greedy war machine. Yeah. And it's it's such an important point that you make about the the volume price relationship. You know, and when you go back, so much of Putin's focus seems to be on regaining the status that Russia lost with the fall of the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union fell, one of the big drivers of that during its collapse was the collapse in oil and gas prices in the, you know, mid to late 80s. So we've seen this play out historically. It's, you know, low prices undermine his government, not high prices. And all the years people have looked at OPEC, you know, if you're if you're trying to raise the price, what do you do? Restrict the volume. So in a large sense, we've helped enforce a better monopoly on some of the the, the oil and gas in the world right now by restricting those volumes because we haven't cut them all off <laughs> and we haven't flooded the market either. It's one thing to sanction a small country that produces 200,000 barrels of oil per day for export. That's doable, but we're talking about literally the largest exporter of energy in the world. And as we said in the piece, uh, I believe it was in Crazy Pills, we don't want to take Russia's, we shouldn't want to take Russia's energy off the global market because it would collapse the entire modern economy, including ours. There would be riots, there would be social unrest, there would be revolutions. Um, The world cannot live without Putin's energy, full stop. Axiom number one in the analysis. If your objective is to minimize Putin's revenue, the only handle you have is production volume, your own production volume, and beg and pray that he doesn't unilaterally cut the world off of his energy just to make a point, which is what he is doing to Western Europe today. We had no cards, and we're still acting as though we have all the leverage. This utterly crazy G7 proposal on capping the price of Russian oil has to be the most insane thing we've ever come across. The hubris, <laughs> in their delusion, the G7 leaders think they can dictate to 4 billion people uh, what they will pay for property that does not belong to the G7. It's quite literally absurd. Pushed forward by Janet Yellen, who is a, a product of uh, cushy jobs at universities and, and a small stint at a think tank, but who has only otherwise lived um, in, in the halls of the, of the Federal Reserve. It's literal insanity. I, and and I, I just, it baffles the mind. You know, this morning we have the president of the European Union out saying that, uh, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve, uh, we're going to do, um, don't call it rationing, but we're going to do a mandatory cutbacks uh, of energy to flatten the curve because, you know, we just want to shave off the peaks. Like she has no idea what she's talking about. And it's okay to point out that the emperor has no clothes. Because uh, that train's going to hit us either way. You may as well at least try 
to point out the flaws and, and the fallacies of, of, of the pronunciations of our political leaders. It's, David, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but it is what it is. You know, it's just, it's the world we find ourselves in. Yeah. I, I know I often you know, scratch my own head and try to figure out what are they not seeing? You know, if, if it's an honest conversation, is there, is there some way you could show them the world from a different perspective that might make a difference? And a couple of pieces, I'd like to share these with you and get your thoughts. Cause I do think one of the issues is that policymakers often don't deal with the problem until, you know, I like guess Jeff Curry said on our podcast, when it's at the doorstep and in commodity markets, if you want to change supply and demand, it's best to do it with a lot of lead time when there's time to invest, when there's time for people to switch to alternatives. In the short term, not a lot you can do to bring on more supply or to get people to curtail demand other than very high prices that inflict a lot of pain and get people to, to pull back the way we're seeing them pull back in Europe. So short term thinking leads to a lot of pain in commodity markets. You got to be longer term. And as you, you know, open this conversation with, you know, a lot of the long-term conversation in energy in recent years has been dominated by ESG and energy transition and important things, but not putting enough investment to, you know, make the, the fossil fuels unnecessary at this point. And we're seeing that happen even before the restriction on Russian flows into Europe. And the other that you brought up that I think is really important is that I've noticed that in a lot of the policy discussions, that a lot of the policymakers seem to think in terms of euros and dollars, while energy markets people like yourself think in volumes. You know, how many cubic meters of gas do we got? How many megawatt hours of power? How many barrels of oil? And when you think in volumes, you quickly realize there just isn't enough. And that the problem is you got to figure out how are we going to either get more volumes or how are we going to redistribute the volumes we have to inflict the least pain as possible, given the situation we found ourselves in, where I think when people think in prices, they get kind of in, in this strange land of, well, we'll just give everybody more money so that they can pay their heating bill. Well, yes, if you give everyone more money, you're just going to raise the price higher because what ultimately leads people to cut back on demand is the price is too high and they've run out of money. So you know, if you're not fixing the volume problem, the price isn't going to help you. I was just curious about, you know, your thoughts on that. And do you think shifting and maybe, you know, getting people on the policy side to look at markets from that volume perspective could lead to a better policy outcome? Lots of different ways to tackle that. It's a, it's a great point and one that we have made forcefully <laughs> in some of our pieces. But let's just stop for a second and do a little bit of thinking here. Energy is actually the ultimate currency. And the currencies we're familiar with, the euro, the dollar, the yen, they are just sort of overlaying our energy transactions in the hopes of making them more efficient. That's the way you need to think about the world. And this is especially true during a time of energy shortage. So everyone is saying the dollar is getting stronger and the dollar against certain currencies is getting stronger. What are those currencies? So the way we measure the dollar strength today is through this index called the DXY. But if you look at the DXY, 83% of that index is composed of um, the euro, the yen, and the British pound. All three of those regions are chronically short energy today, and that's why their currencies are debasing for the exact front-running of the phenomenon that we know government leaders will do, which is to try to print fiat in a desperate effort to secure molecules. But of course, you can't print molecules. And so the Russian ruble, of course, has strengthened quite radically because Putin has all the cards now. The US dollar is doing quite fine against these currencies uh, because the US is a net energy exporter or in worse is, is really pretty much balanced. And so while energy and your relative position as an importer or an exporter doesn't explain all of the variance of your currency movement, it certainly explains a fair bit of it. And in times of chronic shortages, I would bet that your energy position might explain 80% of the variance of your currency's movements, um, which is what we're seeing today. The yen is collapsing um, as we speak, which is a sort of another bomb waiting to go off in Asia. So yes, you cannot print molecules. And when you're in a period of shortage, I think we've gone far enough now into the season that we, and Putin's recent decision on Nord Stream 1 basically assures that Europe is entering the winter with an insufficient amount of molecules. So now the only question becomes, what is the most economically efficient slash socially acceptable way to ration the insufficient but mo remaining molecules that they do have? 
in our piece, well, we just put two pieces in a row out on Europe because it's just irresistible. But in the piece we, we put out called The Dead of Winter, we rolled out uh, Doomberg's law of anti-logic. And in that law, we assume that uh, the current slit of Western leaders will make the very worst possible decision at every opportunity. And we advise our clients to assume as much in their modeling. And we predicted price caps, we predicted stimulus, and we predicted protectionism. And not but a week later, uh, it seems as though things are accelerating at such a pace. Uh, literally, not just price caps internally, but we had the president of the European Union today saying that she's considering putting a price cap on global LNG as though she has some magic wand to dictate to the world the price of something everyone in the world knows she desperately needs. It's like Rome has fallen and uh, the, the Roman Senate still thinks it's a global superpower. It's high time for Europe to get very serious about the important business of rationing and doing so in a way that uh, minimizes damage to the most vulnerable in their society. Um, so for example, if we take what, what is currently being done, uh, take Germany, you know, uh, they've rolled out a 65 billion euro stimulus to be paid for by, uh, wait for it, windfall profits taxes on the very energy producers that they're reliant upon to get the incremental volumes to get them through the winter. This will simultaneously increase the price, decrease supply, and backfire in the most spectacular way possible, thereby proving the theory of anti-logic. We're seeing the same thing in the UK. Look, this is not easy, and we take no pleasure in having been right. Uh, we would much, much prefer to be on this podcast today apologizing for being alarmist. Um, but it's just, it's just, I don't see a path out. Like it, the, the die is cast, and uh, Europe came up snake eyes. It, it's going to be amazing to watch this play out in the next few weeks and months. Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure there'll be many heartrending moments along with it. And I wanted to ask you, because in terms of where can those extra volumes come from, at least to some extent, um, you know, LNG has been the source of the extra volumes coming into Europe. You know, US LNG, to the extent that there is a rescue, um, has been leading the charge, but it's still not enough. Um, you know, the US is now the largest LNG exporter in the world, and US energy production, as you said, is a big part of why our currencies rising relative to those of Europe and Japan. But I want to ask you, you know, where's Canada in all this? You've written a lot about Canadian energy policy. Now, if we're in an energy war, doesn't Canada have a, a larger role to play in this? In our writing, we have been especially critical of Justin Trudeau, who we think is perhaps the most dangerous and simultaneously least capable leader on offer in the Western world today. Canada could be an energy superpower right now. And Justin Trudeau is, an exa is just another example of um, somebody who was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. And, uh, you know, the son of a former prime minister who was sort of ascended to the throne, uh, charismatic guy, you know, handsome man, um, but literally intellectually incapable of leading his way out of a paper bag. And so Canadian energy is trapped. Alberta's oil is finding its way to the U.S. market, um, but the Keystone pipeline was canceled on the U.S. side. To be fair, Biden shares as much of the blame for that um, as anybody. But Putin's nonsense about exporting hydrogen to Germany instead of just building, you know, the, the required liquefied natural gas export terminals. You know, natural gas in Western Canada is, is probably half the price of what natural gas is in the U.S., which is one tenth of the price um, that it was in Europe last week. To bank on Justin Trudeau's regime to make an intelligent decision in the energy sector, I'd put it this way. If you asked me to select who to be led by, the current slate of European leaders or Justin Trudeau, I would reluctantly choose Europe. Uh, so I think we could just take Canada off the board uh, until we see a regime change in Canada, which doesn't seem to be uh, on offer anytime soon. So putting that all together, you know, what's your outlook for this winter? you know, both in Europe and, you know, the knock-on effects potentially for the U.S. market? And kind of what do you see as the best case and the worst case? So the best case is in the next few weeks, the Western world plugs its nose and cuts the best deal it can get for peace uh, with Putin. I know that's probably a controversial thing to say, but as it pertains to resolving the energy crisis, that is the best case. That peace suddenly breaks out, or maybe Putin gets overthrown, or pick your favorite path function, but uh, hostilities end, and taps open, and molecules flow, and the world narrowly averts what could have been 
a, a generational crisis. Uh, we hope for that outcome, to be very clear. Nothing would please us more than this crisis passing with minimal hardship borne by those who can least afford to bear it. That's the best case. Um, the worst case is a rapid and hyperinflationary dissolution of the euro. There are scenarios where you know the pinball machine goes full tilt, which is why we wrote the last piece, Europe on tilt. The worst case scenario is Putin follows through and not only keeps Nord Stream 1 down, but he has another valve he can turn, which is the pipeline through Ukraine, if he completely cuts off Europe. And in fact, he said, or one of his spokespeople said, that any country proposing a price cap on Russian oil would get no gas, no oil, no finished products, no fertilizer, nothing. And if he follows through on that threat at a time of maximum weakness for Europe, it could literally be a catastrophe. And we see nothing in the current responses emanating out of European capitals that give us hope that sensible policies will be chosen. And one of the things we have predicted and we fear is a rightward tilt of European politics already in Italy. You're seeing you know, the leading, what the European media would call far right candidate saying that we're on our knees and we need to sue for peace. We're seeing demonstrations in the Czech Republic. Uh, we're seeing demonstrations in Germany. There is a major risk to the ruling elite in Europe that if they continue to get this as wrong as they have, that they will lose the authority to lead. And we don't think they will go down without a fight. And so, you know, there's lots of scenarios. You're talking about a really chaotic situation, which is incredibly difficult to model. But if they enter the winter with as, as a chronic a shortage of molecules as we anticipate they might, and if in their efforts to um, rationalize those molecules in an efficient way, they bundle it and make things worse, which we, again, all evidence would indicate they will. Um, there are scenarios in play which get very ugly very quickly. Yeah, and speaking of you know how difficult this is to model and things that could get ugly very quickly. Now, as you said, much of the commodity supply part of this has already been decided, or it's in Putin's hands. You know, the number of molecules that'll be available in Europe this winter. And on the demand side, we have how politicians and the public are going to respond to that shortage of molecules. So I was curious, you know, as as analysts and followers of the market, participants in the market, what are you following to keep on top of how this is playing out and determine are we heading to the best case, the worst case, and you know, which which is the next leg? That's a, that's a great question. So um, I guess the best way to answer it is to tell you what our Bloomberg terminal launch pad fires up with every morning when we <laughs> make it to the office. We look at the price of natural gas in the US. We look at the price of natural gas in Europe, and we look at the price of natural gas in Asia. Often unspoken about in this crisis is the impact that elevated natural gas prices in Europe is having on Asia. LNG contract price, uh, JKM, is $55 per million BTU today compared to um, 60 and change in, in Europe. And that, that spread is interesting to us. So is Europe still paying more for the incremental carrier of LNG? We look at the coal price. So one of the charts that we make that we've not published yet, but we're going to sort of share it with our pro tier subscribers in a presentation later this month, is we have developed a way to correct for the units of trade of all of these different energies, commodities, um, so that you can just read across in a very simple way to see on a sort of dollar per million BTU basis, is oil more expensive than coal? Is coal more expensive than natural gas? And if so, where? And one of the interesting phenomenons that we see right now when we eyeball that chart is the price of coal is actually higher than the price of oil, which is interesting because in theory, oil has far more utility. You could do many things with a barrel of oil. With coal, you can basically just burn it to make steam, to make electricity. And so that coal is more expensive than oil is a fascinating little nugget uh, of insight uh, into the global economy. Uh, we obviously look at the major currencies. Uh, the Japanese yen, the euro, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, and then obviously electricity prices uh, in Europe as well. You know, year forward prices, we look at the shape of curves. For example, the natural gas curve for Dutch TTF is pricing extraordinarily elevated prices out till 2024. Prices that just a year ago would have been unthinkable, literally, are now priced into the curve out two years, $40, 50 per million BTU, natural gas. No economy can survive that. And so 
what would we look for? We would look for increased flows. You can actually track the flows um, through Nord Stream. Uh, you know, Bloomberg is just a really powerful tool for the analyst. And um, no matter what they charged us, we'd pay it. You know, don't tell them that. But, um, you know, so again, those are the main ones. We look at the molecules, the price of molecules. We look at, uh, at, at the currencies. And of course, you always keep an eye on gold and Bitcoin sort of as, as reads for um, uh, market mania uh, uh, or lack thereof. Uh, that's great. That's really helpful. You brought up a, a question to my mind is, you know, as we look with likely a lot more government action interference in markets in Europe, um, and you had mentioned like looking at Dutch TTF prices, uh, natural gas prices in Europe, are you worried that those prices are going to stop being representative of the underlying supply demand situation and more representative of the, the political risk and interference in markets? So there's a lot of thumbs on the scale right now. And a lot of it is sort of whispered about, and you don't want to sound too conspiratorial because, okay, what other prices on your Bloomberg don't you believe? We, of course, were accused of, of putting too much emphasis on the relative strength of the Russian ruble because, you know, the constant refrain on Twitter was, oh, what can you do with a ruble? You know, it's only because he has um, capital controls in place. And, and our counter to that is, look, there's 4 billion people still transacting with Russia. And um, the, what the, the number you see on the screen is real and, and what other prices don't you like? And so um, while we do... You know, you just take the mortgage-backed securities market. Of course, the Fed interfered in that market. But it doesn't mean that when I went to the bank and got a mortgage that I got a different price because, well, let's just correct for what the Fed is doing. Price is price. The numbers on the screen are real. And if the governments can um, intervene in the natural gas or oil markets and bring the price down, um, more power to them. And of course, this is what OPEC is designed to do in the other way. Like OPEC literally exists to manipulate the price of oil. And so, yeah, of course, prices are manipulated and governments interfere. But the price on the screen is the price somebody's paying. And it's a clearing price somewhere. And so we just tend to believe it. It's, it's the t to give into the temptation of only believing the prices that fit with your narrative means you won't capture the narrative shifts when they happen. It's great advice. And, you know, I, I wanted to kind of round out the conversation today uh, with something I've heard you, you say in another place. You know, I've heard you say that this winter is a, a critical juncture and that how this winter plays out will be what you know, sets the stage for how energy markets operate for years to come, that it's very difficult to start to project or forecast what energy markets are going to look like in, say, 24 or 25 until we see you know, how the winter of 2022-23 comes to pass. So you may have said that, I bet you said that more eloquently than I did, but how are you thinking about the potential paths forward? coming out of this winter and what it means for the future of energy over you know the next five, 10 years, the foreseeable future. So you are correct. And we have characterized the winter of 2022-23 as the single greatest geopolitical event to resolve uh, in the next few months. I would confess that we are surprised by the speed at which resolution is being imposed by the markets here. Markets, of course, are forward indicating. And so uh, I guess in hindsight, it, we shouldn't have been so surprised. We view the resolution of this event in the same way that a physicist might view a singularity. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that concept, but in a singularity, the laws of physics break down, which means it is fruitless to try to predict what happens on the other side of that singularity because it's literally unknowable. The Big Bang Theory is predicated on such a singularity, and famous physicists uh, like to say that it doesn't matter what happened before the Big Bang because it, it was a singularity. And we think there's an economic singularity on the horizon. And um, the range of potential outcomes are so chaotic that it is basically fruitless to try to model it. We spend most of our time reading real-time data to see where things are going in the near term because like the weather yes you can predict three four five days ahead week ahead is a bit sketchy and after two weeks just forget about it we think we're in the same type of scenario right now with europe you could imagine things like you know an overthrow of the german government as crazy as that might sound you could imagine things as crazy as uh, mass starvation in, in western countries because of a cold snap like pray for a warm winter right and if your strategy is to pray you've lost um no offense to the to the religious amongst your listeners, but you know, so it, it's truly a singularity. I don't know that you you can look past this December, let's say, and speak with any kind of authority about what's going to what things are going to look like in the spring or next winter or two years after that. Other than to say, perhaps, well, you can't even say that. Like I was going to say, perhaps that we will learn our lesson and reacquaint ourselves with uh, with physics over platitudes, but it's not clear to me. Um, that in fact, uh, whoever replaces this crop of leaders uh, would be any better. So it, it literally, I don't think 
and not trying to sound like a cop out. I don't think you could you could see through a singularity with any intelligence. And so it's best to just admit that you can't and observe the uh, short term with a keen interest. Thanks again to Doomberg, the team behind one of the most widely read finance newsletters on Substack. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Please join us next week when our guest will be Mark Lewis, head of climate research at Underground Capital Management. We'll be having Mark back to discuss how the European energy crisis is affecting the European carbon markets. This episode was brought to you in part by ABAX Exchange. Market participants need the confidence and ability to secure funding for resource development, production, processing, refining, and transportation of commodities across the globe with markets for LNG, battery metals, and emissions offsets at the core of the transition to sustainability, ABAX Exchange is building solutions to manage risk in these rapidly changing global markets. Facilitating futures and options contracts designed to offer market participants clear price signals and hedging capabilities in those markets essential to our sustainable energy transition. ABAX Exchange, bringing you better benchmarks better technology, and better tools for risk management. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees, and producer, Abax Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next week.